something's in my throat. I'm sorry. It's going to cause me a little bit of distress for first minute or two. I hope that's all. <clears throat> I don't know if it's pollen or what, but anyway, just let me uh, admit these other people. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, we're 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 now going to shift gears to art of East Asia for the next um, two lectures. <clears throat> art of China is today's topic, and art of Japan will be the topic for uh, next lecture on Wednesday. Hang on. Okay. All right, uh, we're just starting. So a couple of announcements before we get to today's slides on uh, art of China. The first uh, thing is that uh, I made uh, an announcement in class on the Zoom lecture uh, last Wednesday, I think it was, that I was going to increase, I am increasing the maximum amount of extra credit points that you can get uh, from 50 to 60 for everybody in all my classes. And that, that just in light of the fact that apparently about five people did not, um, hang on, this is maybe a couple more people. There we go. <coughs> uh, at least five people who hung in throughout the entire midterm, uh, you know, the real time midterm didn't submit tests. So I can't go back and change the rules. That wouldn't be fair to those who did submit by the deadline. However, those who might have been in that category, if that applies to anybody here now or who watches this video on <coughs> YouTube after 8 p.m. Friday when it's posted, you can make up 60 of those points. And that's a big chunk of what you might have missed uh, for those who want to. But it's good for everybody who cares to give themselves, you know, a margin, a cushion for extra, you know, uh, points that will raise your grade as you know a whole more than a letter grade actually right so you could be getting you know like a, a c or a c plus and end up with a, a b or, or a, a b b minus and end up with an a if you if you took advantage of all the extra credit options uh, <clears throat> so those apply to everybody in all three of my classes equally so no one's getting a bigger or lesser advantage a greater or lesser advantage in terms of the maximum you can do. <laughs> Interesting image there. <laughs> Not Excuse sure what me, Mr. That Wilson, uh, have yeah. you notified those people who they are? No, um, because I don't really have, um, I could try and reconstruct it, but I don't have time. Hmm. I'd have to go back and look at all the names and do a reduction. There's like 38 students in the class. It's a good question, uh, but uh, they know who they are. Uh, I didn't get exams from five out of the 35 people and by the way, I've been returning them as I get them graded uh, little by little. So far, people are doing well on that exam. It was an open book exam. And I was very clear again for, you know, just to recap <clears throat> for several days or a week before the, the exam that I, I wasn't going to post it on YouTube because then that's not fair to the people in the in-person class. Everyone should have a level playing field in, uh, you know, light of equity and fair play and an equal opportunity for everyone. So I gave you guys till midnight. <clears throat> so if somebody logged on, saw the test, those five people, and then just for whatever reason, not to submit uh, their exam before the deadline, the only thing they can do and still get a B in the class is to take advantage of all the extra credit. And of course, do well on their papers. I've already got, of course, uh, I'm grading those too. I got them back to back. So give me till uh, maybe this weekend, I'll have both the midterm, all the midterms that were submitted and the papers on time. Speaking of which, I haven't gotten papers from about a, a dozen people. That's not you know, terribly uh, a difficult thing for you to do to make it up, but don't wait, please. If you're one of those who didn't turn your first paper in, I would advise you to get them done in the next a few days or week at least because <clears throat> before you know it the second paper will be due you've got other classes i'm sure midterms are still coming up in some of the other subjects that some of you are taking <clears throat> and then you know you don't want to be backed into a corner right before final exams so it's only 10 points off okay there we go it's only 10 points off if you uh turn in a paper anytime between now and the week before finals but I need them before final exams week, both papers. So don't, don't put yourself in that, that uh, bind where you've got 
two papers due and you've got to study for finals. It, it never works out well for anyone with their grade if, if they get in that situation. So try to get your, if you didn't already turn your first paper in, please do so. Remember, I've said it so many times, I'm going to keep repeating everything uh, in, in great detail, but the gist being has to be a PDF, should have the cover sheet attached in the same file, if not then a separate file, submit it at the same time to markw at aol.com. Okay, any questions before we proceed with tonight's, uh, I keep saying tonight, today's topic on Art of China. I'm gonna go ahead and do the speaker view now. Any questions about extra credit or about uh, your papers or late work or anything like that, now's a good time. Uh, of course, I stick around afterwards. I always have for as many minutes as need be for people to ask questions after the lecture's done. Anybody have any other questions, Jim? Oh, that's, yeah, I've heard that's happening a little bit. <clears throat> Anybody here? My daughter was all like, God, oh, this morning. Uh, both uh, <clears throat> um, Facebook and, now I forget the other one <laughs> that they own. I forget the other platform they own, are down. And Mark Zuckerberg lost $7 billion worth of capitalized, about, I doubt, whatever. It's all over the, her whatever yeah uh, instagram i think is the instagram other yeah that was it yeah so if you're thinking of stalking someone or, or communicating <laughs> with someone on either platform it might be a, a little bit of a delay they'll probably have it fixed soon like tonight or tomorrow don't know why somebody speculated with sun players that i haven't heard anything like that <clears throat> but china's cracking down on their own media well they're not cracking down they're going to try and uh, force their own media platforms, those created in China that are doing quite well in the world market into the party line, meaning they're going to have, well, in essence, more than a little censorship, but also a whole bunch of more controls that might lower their value factor on the international markets. Chinese uh, internet companies have dropped in value as well as some of the real estate firms because somehow they're connected. I, I don't know the details. Anyway, so Hopefully you didn't invest and then have to sell right away in one of those entities. If any of you even are thinking of that, I'm just being silly, of course. But, you know, it's a strange world we live in. So, yeah, I've been hearing that there are issues occasionally with people logging on, uh, even when everything's working for 90 some percent of my students. So just always try to, uh, I guess it was JT that mentioned, just, you know, for anyone, who this happens to, if you can't log on the first time, try again in like three or four minutes. It usually, usually works if it doesn't the first time. I, I, so I always send the link, right? Uh, once in a blue moon, I've forgotten to hit copy link and then that's, that's on me. But I haven't done that since I think the first week of class. Hopefully you won't have that issue. So I send the invitation, let's say sometime between 245 and 250 because I, I have other things I have to prepare for very, very quickly. I'll keep this a quick aside because we have enough time and still end on time to cover the must know slides. There's only six, but there are important ones on China. But in about 90 seconds, we'll get to the first uh, must know slide. I just finished discussing with uh, a textbook company. You, Some of you know the company because you should have uh, Sarah Gill's, you're supposed to, right? Required text, which was published by Kendall Hunt. They've been around since 1945. That's a long time before my time, right? They've been around since what the end of World War II as a national textbook company, well respected. Uh, they just agreed to publish in principle with some details yet to be ironed out, but most of them have been. Uh, a book I'm going to be writing, I've already started working on the research uh, called Designing Women, the West's First Female Architects. I'm kind of excited because no one's done a book about that. I didn't know before I started doing the research that there were women in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, even before Julia Morgan, my heroine, who I did my master's thesis about, that did her castle and more buildings than Frank Lloyd Wright, the first American woman to have her own office. But before that, there were women designing buildings all over the West Coast, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, and well, Arizona, I'm including Arizona because there's like two architects, female architects that were working there in the early 1900s. I knew about some of them, but not all. So this book will cover the major ones, about 10 uh, that are getting their fair share and no uh, you know, credit for what they designed. And their buildings are still standing in many cases. Let's see, did we still, do we need to admit anybody else here? Let's see. Yeah, sorry. Okay. 
and there we go. Okay, so we're just saying that uh, we're about to start the uh, slides on China. But anyway, once that book becomes a reality, in other words, the project gets a, a contract signed and a, a date certain, then it won't be until 2023 it'll be available. Uh, for any of the art history classes that cover 19th and 20th century uh, architecture, of course, depends on you know what what the policies are by then. But uh, in my classes, I probably will require it. I think it's reasonable because it directly relates to the unsung, I'll call them heroes, heroines, whatever, accomplished women who didn't get attention during their lifetime. <clears throat> Well, anyway, yeah, I, I'll get to the lecture now. So any questions before we start? Because we were just joined by two or three people. Let's see, did, oh, I'm sorry, Randy. Yeah, welcome. We're just about to start the first slide on China. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so here we go. Yes, question? Somebody have, okay, let, let's, try. yes. I thought I heard somebody start to, because we yeah, kind of need to get to the first slide, but I'll stick around afterwards. I always do for any other questions that you might have. Okay, let's do this hideaway thing and get it off the screen or up in the corner, and then let's enlarge this. This is a map of China. Remember, I always like to start with context. Uh, some of these facts are self-evident to many of you. I'm going to have to turn on my... Uh, my portable fan it's getting really warm here i don't know how it is in santa rosa but i think we got one more day of warm weather and then it's supposed to cool off <clears throat> got a little rain in the north i have friends who were at humboldt state university and they said they got a decent amount of rain up there so it's going to help suppress hopefully the remainder of the fire season let's keep our fingers crossed okay china as some of you may know is the most populous country in the world though that won't be the case in a few years probably less than five years india will surpass china but right now China is the most populous country on earth with 1.4 billion people. And it has the same, land, almost very close to the same land area, 3.6 million, if you're curious to know, square miles as the US, including Alaska and Hawaii, the total area covered by the 50 US states and China's almost equal. And they have four times as many people. So again, without having to be a math whiz, you can figure that out. But if it's not obvious, that means they're four times more crowded than we are as a country. Now, I have been all over this part of China. And you see, it used to be called Canton, and now it's Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Macau, which they don't have on here. It's over here. It's a, por a former Portuguese colony, all of which are now controlled. Hong Kong, Macau uh, are back under Chinese control. And of course, they'd like to try and take control of Taiwan, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> I have friends that live there. They'd rather have their independence. So what we have is a country with not only a huge population and, and a huge land area, but one of the five, now this is something you could write as part of the meaning for all the slides today of Chinese art, that China uh, was one of the five oldest urban civilizations on earth. The others already mentioned, but I'll recap, would be India, uh, Babylon, Egypt, and Mesoamerica. We're going to cover that next week, uh, which would be Mexico uh, all the way south toward so about uh, the Panama Canal and that area, <coughs> Central America, some people call it. Uh, we'll get to that next week. So, so that gives them a distinction that they've had over 5,000 years of urban civilization. So we're now going to see some of the images from the, the most recent art that they've had. Okay, this is the first must know. And uh, it's the title is a thousand, as in the number, thousand peaks and many ravines. I think you all know it's R-A-V-I-N-E-S, right? A thousand peaks and many ravines. Of course, all these slides are, <laughs> the location is China. And the date is 1693. Well, this is an example of Chinese three-tier perspective. Now, that's your first of only two. We only have two definitions for today's lecture. It's near the top of the page, just below Mogul. Okay, so what is that definition? Here we go. It's, it's not short, so I'll say it slowly and repeat it. Chinese three-tier perspective is a technique for depicting depth in a two-dimensional work of art invented by Chinese artists 
comma. That's just the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. That's three parts to it. The title tells you that, right? I'll say it again. It's a technique for depicting depth in a two-dimensional work of art invented by Chinese artists, comma, which has three features. Okay. I'm going to illustrate those as you go. Objects in the foreground, whoops, <laughs> objects in the foreground are shown larger and sharper. That's number one. Objects in the foreground are shown larger and sharper. Objects in the middle ground have a hazy, misty look. Objects in the middle ground, I should say, are obscured. I'll say it again. Objects, the second feature, objects in the middle ground are obscured by a hazy, misty look. And number three, objects in the distance are shown sharp and smaller than those in the foreground, of course. I'll say it again. Number three is objects in the distance are shown as sharp. You could say sharper, at, but that would be misleading. So just say objects in the distance are shown sharp and as sharp and um, smaller than those in the foreground. That's actually a pretty accurate way the human eye perceives distance in a landscape, which this clearly obviously is. So what we have here are, do it again, these objects in the foreground, you see everything is sharp and clear, the rocks, the trees, the pagoda there, uh, this, uh, well, that's a pagoda there, and this little house, I assume, even the stream coming down through the, you know, hillsides. So all of the parts of, or the objects in the lower part of this, right, uh, are shown with sharp and clear detail and uh, fairly large compared to what? the middle ground in which you see the mist that's coming off the mountains here. It obscures a lot of the mountains. Uh, and therefore these, you see here, this especially here, but also over on the uh, far left, uh, have a kind of a misty, hazy look to them, which is what happens, of course, often in the distance when you look out towards, you know, mountain range or hills, uh, you often see a mist or a hazy, kind of uh, effect uh, in the middle distance. And then finally, the third thing again is, of course, when the objects there we have at the top of the peaks and the very far on the horizon, basically, those are sharp, just like the ones in the foreground, but obviously they're smaller because the, in the, you can't even, barely even see the trees, right? And, and uh, then there's, you know, the tops of these peaks uh, aren't as dominant as these boulders here, like this boulder right there. Okay, so you've got three different sections. That is each of the Chinese works of art, whether it's a drawing or a painting, that depicts, you know, in a two-dimensional frame. This is a scroll painting. We'll describe that's the other part of the meaning. What is this? What is the scene that depicts? But the technique is a really important part of the meaning here. It could easily come up on the uh, final now we're talking about the final and i'm not cutting this slide from the study list it's a very important slide because it illustrates that technique fairly well um in some works of art you'd see the misty hazy look even all the way down to the base of the mountains but here it's so such a long view that they're just limiting it to the upper half uh, and then when you get to the very distance where the hazy look is missing you get this sharp uh, look on all the objects, but they're smaller they're for, because they're further away. Okay, so the other part of the meaning is, well, what are we looking at? It's a classic example of a Chinese landscape scroll painting. Scrolls, um, I know all of you have, I, I assume you've all seen scroll work in some, you know, shop, a museum, whatever, or, you know, maybe documentaries or in textbooks. Um, th they are paintings on some kind of heavy duty, usually not paper, but sometimes they are parchment or, or some kind of other, uh, you know, could even be um, fabric, right? Uh, which are usually eight to 10 feet tall. That's about the height of this one in the range of eight, not all exactly, but most of the scroll paintings I've seen are about eight to 10 feet tall and therefore narrower 
than they are tall, of course, and they are meant to be rolled up so you can move them around and then you can place them, hang them, I should say, hang them from the top of um, you know, the wall or near the top of a wall in any room you choose. So scroll paintings, Chinese scroll paintings are a very uh, old tradition. They go back over a thousand years. So by the time this one was done, what, about 330 or so years ago, uh, that was an old tradition. So la the last part of the meaning now is what are in those paintings besides the obvious thing, the mountains and the mist and the trees. Well, it's a very specific list of things that traditionally are found, or you could say are almost always found in traditional Chinese landscape painting, whether it's a scroll painting like this or a, you know, a, 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 just a single painting, you know, a wall painting. Um, so what are those objects? Well, you can see them more clearly when you get up close. Trees, I'll say this list slowly and repeat it. And that's the last part of the meaning now for this slide. So that included in, in all traditional Chinese landscape paintings, there would be this, these objects, trees, rocks or boulders, you can say it either way. Okay. Um, waterfalls or, or water features, you could even say, because here it's obviously a small waterfall. Pagodas, and this one I think you can see is, we're going to define the word pagoda in just a couple minutes after the formal analysis of this. Um, you know, the kinds of, of architectural wooden buildings, right, that style of architecture that's common in all of Asia, not just China. So pagodas, right? Trees, rocks, streams or waterfalls, and mountains w with mist. Of course, if it's going to be in that vein, it's uh, by definition a Chinese three tiers per perspective style of painting, then it's going to have the misty, hazy look in the background near the back, near the top. Okay, so that explains everything except one thing. These were done by scholars who were trained both as uh, poets or authors, usually poets, and sometimes they included a poem right on the, the, the artwork, on the surface of the scroll in this case. That might be a poem describing the beauty of this scene. Uh, having traveled across parts of China by train, it, it, it is a pretty impressive. And now we're just in the south where the mountains aren't as big as they are in the interior or further north. I only saw southern China. Guangdong province is called uh, all around uh, Guangzhou, the biggest city there, which is the oldest city in China, way older than Beijing. Uh, it, beautiful countryside. <clears throat> um, so what you have is the beauty of the landscape captured on scroll, uh, in this case, a scroll painting with a, uh, an artist who was also a scholar and left or included, I'm sorry, left included in the uh, work of art, uh, some lines of a poem describing the scene, of course, in poetic terms. And that's a very classic tradition for artists uh, who were also scholars. They were usually both. Most artists were trained as scholars as well as you know, writers and others as well as illustrators. Okay, <clears throat> formal analysis. Well, this might look warm because of the material. And so if you said that, I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, disagree. But actually, it's closer to being neutral because this is actually black ink with the misty and uh, empty areas, <clears throat> pretty much an off white. It's faded, of course, and discolored. This is, you know, over 300 years old. But originally, it would have been a very light, at most, a very minimal light tan in the sky, possibly. Of course, you had these red Chinese characters here. So that's a little bit of warm detail in the color, or sorry, warm color in the details up at the top. But mostly, it's neutral. Black, you know, ink with off-white background in, in the actual landscape. The rhythm is obvious. It's the basic part of all Chinese landscape painting, whether it's scroll painting or you know, easel, I don't know, they didn't do easel painting, you know, wall paintings uh, or miniatures. I have one in my living room, miniature painted on a vase. They always had this powerful rhythms, repeated shapes of the mountain peaks, the jagged right tops of the mountains, the trees, and of course the boulders, the bushes and smaller plants, and then the various uh, buildings. Lots of rhythm. The lines are both bold and thin, as they would be in almost all Chinese landscape painting. Bold around, 
most of the objects in the foreground, you'll see certainly around the trees and the boulders, I would say they're all those lines. But then the, the buildings have more thin lines, right? And some of the uh, trees and, and rocks in the middle ground are not uh, bold lines, but it, it gets back into the use of bold line, I would say, on the mountaintops uh, as you get to the distance of the uh, peaks there. And then we have dynamic. I, I almost see nothing stable. I mean, you could make the case, I suppose, that that tree trunk is stable. Yeah, some of the tree trunks are, but even many of the trees curved are curved and therefore dynamic, right? Uh, possibly you could say the pagodas in the middle. There's at least two, right? Uh, th those have some straight lines, but mostly it's curved and, and diagonal, or therefore diagonal and curved lines, obviously making it overwhelmingly dynamic. For space, well, we have several techniques. We have diminishing size because that's in essence inherent, right? In the definition I just gave everyone, right? That will come up. I can tell you that definition will come up at some point on the final. So by definition, a Chinese three-tier perspective is gonna have diminishing size. The mountains and the trees get smaller the farther away they are. There is overlapping, obviously. <clears throat> that's, that's a given in almost every two-dimensional work of art the mountains overlapping each other, the trees overlapping them, and so forth. Uh, and I would say there's foreshortening here, too, on the edges of some of these uh, hills. To me, it looks like it, at least, especially around here. Uh, so there's some foreshortening. But there is no scientific perspective or atmospheric perspective, because you, it's not a color work of art. But even if it was, they didn't use uh, the bluish, hazy look. They used a misty, hazy actual mist in the middle ground, not in the distance. So don't confuse those two techniques. So Chinese future perspective has a vague similarity to atmospheric perspective in the middle ground, but it's not the same thing. So there's no atmospheric perspective and no scientific perspective. Um, and then we have the largest mass. Well, that's up to how you see it. I, if you count this whole range of mountain peaks in the distance, that would be the largest mass. And then perhaps some of the boulders down here or this this hillside where this the waterfall is or you could even make the case some of these trees that are in the foreground or second largest and then it would probably be the smaller rocks after that <clears throat> let's see balance yes definitely they would have tried to balance that's aesthetically pleasing to almost all the uh, chinese landscape paintings i've ever seen um right I'd say roughly top to bottom and left to right. But I have had people say, well, wait a minute, this area is, you know, nearly empty. I wouldn't dispute that, except that when you add the, the poetry, to me, that roughly balances out with the trees in the bottom or lower uh, right corner. Okay, rhythm, I think, I, oh, texture. Yeah, there's good semiotic texture on the mountains, the trees, and of course, modeling is strong and realistic, except in the middle ground where the mist is. Everywhere else, it's very strong and sharp. Okay, moving on. That one I think I'm going to cut. I'm trying to, I want to cut at least one. I, tr I usually do that from now on for the rest of this semester. On average, at least one slide from each of the uh, topics. Um, let's see. Yeah, this one is the uh, Ging Bian. Some say Ging Bang, but I think it's pronounced Ging Bian Mountains, China, 1617. I'm going to cut it so you can cross it off, but I think you want to take notes, uh, not not take notes, sorry, not take notes, but be aware of one thing about this that's different. So, okay, everybody see you take your, on a week eight, second from the bottom, take your pen and cross out that one we won't uh, have to take, you won't have to take notes on that. It won't be on the final. Ging Bang Mountains, China, 1670. So, what we're looking at, though, just so you know, is a much more intense example of that scholar slash artist overlap, if you want to call it that. <laughs> I know it's a funny phrase to say, you know, overlapping, you know, roles <clears throat> or dual, maybe a better word is dual roles played by uh, artists. This is also a scroll painting, but it's a sideways one. So that makes it unusual. You don't have to write this, but I just think it's it's worth a minute or two just to clarify why I, it's even in the textbook and what's different about it. Uh, you see here, this doesn't have Chinese three-tier perspective. It's not even a, a far enough of a way view to have that. 
as a, as a technique. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to that. But what it does have is a whole bunch of these lines of prose and or poetry. Sometimes it's prose, but usually it'd be poetry that the artist would have included from some you know, ver verbal description of this scene that they wanted to emphasize whatever they thought was the most important visual elements or the, what made it so beautiful or interesting enough for them to want to illustrate it. <clears throat> so again, it's a good example of that whole, and, and it was a class of people that had to compete with uh, lots of other students trying to enter the highest levels of education little like our Ivy League schools, but even more competitive. Which was if you, you know, passed rigorous entrance exams and, you, and they were hours and hours long, so days, three days in a row, really stressful. And then you would be admitted. And of course, you had to keep up the hard work to to uh, matriculate or graduate and get a degree uh, in whatever it was. And that meant you'd have a guaranteed government job. Uh, working for the local or regional or even uh, national government officials, producing works of art, poetry, you know, uh, historical, you know, records you might write about the history of that area. You had to be multi-skilled, you know, both in the written language, poetry and prose, and uh, in, you know, drawing. Um, it's an interesting concept. The artist slash scholar, um, concept in China was very, very strong. Uh, of course, today that isn't the case, but up until the early 1900s or even well into the 20th century, that was still the case. Okay, but that's not a must-know. Now the next one will be. This is one of my favorite works and I, it's one I'm not gonna cut because it's just so lovely and it, it, it illustrates some of the things I've already stated and I'll recap how that re they relate to this in terms of meaning. But it's also more specific to the period of time that uh, we're uh, discussing. So the title of this one, <laughs> it's the second one down on the list for today under week eight. Hundreds plural, of course, hundreds of birds admiring peacocks. Of course, the location again is China. And the date, a little C, you can always ignore that if it's on the exam. You just round it off to 1500. We don't have the exact date. So that makes it what, uh, during what would have been the Renaissance, right, which we've already covered, the high Renaissance even, right, about the time of da Vinci and Michelangelo. To me, that's an interesting fact. You don't have to write that. But Gives you a point of comparison, you know, context. Okay, so this was a period during which the Ming Dynasty ruled. Ming, M-I-N-G. That's the. There are several ways of spelling that, but that's the most common spelling in English of this period during which uh, there was a flowering of the arts and the scholar slash artist class. Uh, prospered or, or, or thrived, a better word is thrived, because the government supported them and it was fairly, uh, was a prosperous period in the history of China. The Ming dynasty were dis, uh, uh, rulers, the emperors from the Ming, M-I-N-G again, capital M of course, uh, were descended from Mongols, if you may know that. They had invaded Mongol uh, warlike tribe to the north of China, had invaded China, taken over, and at the time of the early 1300s, they started intermarrying, right, with the local population, at least among the upper educated classes. And you end up having then a, an indigenous Chinese, you know, dynasty that had its roots in a foreign culture, the Mongols. But they adopted Chinese art and culture. So I'll say that again. This is a period by this time about 200 years or so after the Mongols had first invaded China, when they had totally integrated into Chinese society and they were known as the Ming Dynasty. And it was a time of great prosperity and a great flowering of the arts, both the visual and written arts. So this Chinese slash artist, sorry, I'm an artist slash scholar uh, class uh, really, really uh, became very prominent. And that's what this is, an example of these birds are symbolic of those very uh, scholars, you know, slash artists. We'll just say scholars because that's what they were called. They were called the scholar class. The birds flitting around this beautifully de de detailed tree trunk here that looks like it's 
you know, out, on its way out, <laughs> you know, it's hollow and it's probably, you know, one of the, I have a tree like that in my backyard where a few more years it'll flower and blossom and the, tr the leaves will come out and it'll eventually fall over. But now it's still bearing some kind of, uh, you know, greens, greenery, whatever you want to say, it doesn't look like a fruit tree. But what's important are the peacocks and their interaction, uh, acting or interactions with the scholar classes, which the birds are symbolic of. The peacocks are symbolic of the Ming rulers or ruling class, not the individual rulers like the emperor and his you know, family or ministers necessarily, but the whole Ming ruling class. They are the magnificent birds that the scholars uh, fly around and, you know, if you want to say, are entranced by, or, in, you know, obviously therefore, um, subservient to of course they're subservient in a way though that's not like you know a servant who literally is a foot servant or some other kind of lowly servant but but scholars were serving the country uh, the government and the ruling classes as they as they've already mentioned so that's what the symbolic meaning underlying this is is a very important part of that that's when the title also gives us some hint of birds admiring peacocks they're admiring their you know ruling class and and the greats you know respect that they had because their livelihood depended on them right for the government supporting them the artists the, the, the scholars through that that system of uh, exams right and competitive right uh positions and today we call it civil service but civil service don't usually in our culture in western culture they don't usually also double as, as artists and scholars sometimes they do of course they, at different times that's been more true than now but it was the norm in china in that period we're talking about again it's ming it's the second to the last dynasty in china m-i-n-g they're the ones that built the forbidden city we'll see that in one of the upcoming slides okay what else to say about this is that the classic kind of chinese uh landscape here is not look carefully i think you all can see this before i even tell you, but if it's not obvious, you should write this. This does not use Chinese three-tier perspective. It doesn't have enough of a distant view. It's not intended to show a landscape. It's intended to show a close-up of, you know, plants and, and animals, particularly look how beautiful the flowers are, how beautifully done. This is a real masterpiece. Uh, and it is a scroll painting. It's a little wider than most scroll paintings, but all scroll paintings I've seen, well, unless they were like the one we saw, right, let's go back to it. This one, of course, it is, it is meant to be a, a rolled or unrolled uh, right to left. But most of them, it's from top down. They would hang from the picture railing, they call it. I don't know if any of you have a house where that we do. I have my house hanging pictures from a wooden railing uh, at the top of your walls. That was a common thing. I've, see, I've seen them in homes in China when I was there. So, so this is a scroll painting meant to be hung from, from a wall uh, and, and, and it's portable. Uh, and it shows the high level of skill of these artists, which we're going to cover in just a minute with the formal elements. But then you don't want to make that mistake. Make sure that it's clear in your notes that this is not an example, even though it is a scroll painting and it is a, a, a kind of a landscape. It's too close up. It's, it's too, uh, you know, uh, let's just say limited a view to, to involve any of the uh, use even parts of that three Chinese three-tier perspective. This is not relevant, it's not used in this kind of painting. But it does ex uh, exemplify the skill of artists during this golden age. It was the Ming Dynasty, golden age of uh, support for the arts, uh, for the visual arts and the uh, written arts, poetry, and, uh, drama and history, you know, and prose, of course. Okay. Formal analysis, I think of it as balance, but again, I've had students make this case. This has a high possibility of being on the final, right? Um, that this is empty space. I, I understand that, and so I wouldn't argue. But when I squint, that's how my father was a, a fairly successful artist, supported a family of six on his artwork, freelance. Um, he would say, that's how you can tell something is balanced, even roughly. To me, when you do that, it's, it feels balanced. Maybe just because this bird is such a dominant in these hanging, you know, this looks like almost like a willow tree, doesn't it? Or something like that. 
and there's bird here. But but technically speaking, there is more empty space on the left. So if you want to say it's somewhat unbalanced toward the right, I wouldn't argue. But top to bottom, yes, it is balanced roughly. No, because if you just do this, draw the line across the middle, right about the middle of the trunk, it's, it is definitely a, a roughly equal area of objects and birds and plants above and below. So it's roughly balanced out the bottom and I guess slightly or somewhat unbalanced toward the right. The cement texture is just superb. That's part of the style of the Ming Dynasty uh, painting, the scroll painting. Look at it on this wonderful uh, the tree trunk, the peacocks. Anybody ever had a peacock living near them? I did once, two peacocks living in the backyard of a house I was renting before the one I live in now in North Berkeley. And they'll wake you up with a sound that you cannot ignore. It's a very loud sound. Sounds like a baby crying, or is it even something stranger than that? In the middle, like at 3 a.m., you know, and they'll do it for a long time. They'll back and forth if there's two of them for like an hour. <laughs> so... They're pretty dominant creatures, and these are beautifully detailed. Look at that, the texture of this, you know, their skin, their feathers, uh, the beak, and then the flowers, superb. Everything is realistic. Uh, and the birds, of course, that are flitting around their, their master, if you want to say, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> employers, if you want to put it that way. Um, sponsors, that's the right word, sponsors, the ruling classes. The birds equally. Every everything in this is superbly done, realistic, similar texture and modeling. Uh, then there's bold outline, no question on that tree. But I would say everything else is thin outline. Well, maybe this boulder, yeah, I guess. It's, but everything else, the flowers, the peacocks, and the birds, is basically thin outline. And of course, there are warm colors. The background is entirely warm, kind of a golden color. And the tree trunk has a kind of a dark. Well, it's overlapping with neutral black lines, of course, and shading, but where you can see the color of the trunk, it's, it's a warm kind of a tan. And then the flowers, obviously, some of those are cool and some are warm. And the same with the birds. This bird is black and white, so it's neutral, as is this one. Here you have a red winged bird, yellow winged bird, obviously you get the idea. And then the peacocks are mostly cool colors in this uh, version anyway. The rhythm is very powerful with the repeated shapes of the uh, tree uh, branches, the peacocks, the birds, the flowers, lo lots of rhythm. I don't see any straight lines in it, not really anywhere. So it's, it's basically dynamic, almost 100% dynamic. Um, and then we have for space here, it's overlapping and diminishing size. The birds, some of them are smaller, as, right there further away. And I'd say this foreshortening, at least on the peacocks, or at least one of the peacocks, or even on this one. So there's some foreshortening, there's overlapping, diminishing size, that's it. There are no other techniques, not scientific or atmospheric perspective on this one. Um, let's see, am I forgetting anything? Balance, rhythm, I think we got that dynamic. Yeah, okay, moving on. This is a particularly enchanting uh, image here. Um, let's see. Did I take this off the list? I didn't. I didn't think I did that. I shouldn't have. Let me see. No, no, it's on here. Here it is. Here it is. It's the third one down. Sorry, folks. It's number three on today's list for week eight. Ming Dynasty flask. I've already spelled Ming, and that's capital again, M-I-N-G, Dynasty Flask, China, 1435. Now, I would almost call it a vase, but that's the phrase we're using, the phrase that Stockstead gives it. Um, what's important is not the object itself, but the decoration, the pattern on it. And uh, this is the kind of ceramic painting. And if you prefer to say vase painting, I wouldn't... Uh, you know, say you would be wrong if this is, I'm not saying it's so important I might or might not cut it, but at the moment, of course, always, as always, when we give a lecture and there are notes that you should be taking, assume it could be on the final. Uh, this is, has two features that mark it as a classic Ming era uh, piece of ceramic art, if you prefer to say vase painting, that, that's okay. One is the use of the dragon motif. 
which is symbolic throughout Asian culture and even in many Western cultures, certainly in the, in the Middle Ages in Europe, it was uh, symbolic and in ancient times too. Um, but especially in Asian cultures, dragons are symbolic of strength and the powerful or ruling classes. So this is again symbolic of the Ming dynasty showing you know their own people that they're well you could say in charge or the dominant uh, class the, the ruling class symbolized by a dragon across a seascape those are meant to be waves of an ocean and so here we have i wish i had the other side but i only saw this slide but i think in your textbook it shows both in stockstead the other side is the reverse image where the dragon is formed uh, just exactly the same size and shape, in other words, of a dragon on the opposite side, that's in the blue, you know, uh, cross hatching or lines, overlapping lines that you see here. And the background is, is plain or white. So it, that shows, of course, some people say the yin and yang, but you don't have to write that phrase, but the duality, right, of existence of nature of life <laughs> but you can just say it's it's a different it's a mirror image but with the reverse technique of the reverse coloration of color scheme in that on the this side the one we're looking at there's no front and back or right or wrong here just on the side we see in this slide the, the dragon is the negative space the empty space outlined by the blue waves of the ocean behind it and the reverse is true on the opposite side where we see a dragon in uh, blue ink, right? It would have been ink, right? Uh, on uh, a, uh, a white background. Okay, and then we have some other decorative details that are common to Chinese painting in general, vase painting or landscape painting, scrolls or, or, or otherwise, uh, which are very refined and detailed plants motif somewhat like we saw remember with the flowers and to some degree the tree uh, the uh, aging or nearly dead or dying tree trunk here here it's just flower patterns and flowers and vines I should say on the neck and that's quite common in Chinese ceramic or base painting especially in the Ming dynasty again remember this if it were on the exam you, you could summarize part of the meaning is that this whole period the Ming period was one of flowering of visual arts as well as literary arts uh, and the, the uh, scholar class trained both as artists and writers or you know scholars who produced written texts whether poetry or, or uh, history or whatever uh, they they were uh, thriving under the sponsorship of the ruling class the Ming dynasty prided itself on being very literate and very because they had been warriors you know and they might have been self-conscious about having come from ancestors who were you know uneducated warriors invading another culture but once they intermingled or married into the Chinese population they adopted and even excelled in the, the Chinese traditions that they had now uh, decided to become sponsors of the whole concept I've already mentioned several times of course of the scholars slash artist uh, uh, class and supporting them and promoting them <clears throat> okay formal analysis it's balanced uh, left to right and I would argue top to bottom depending on how you where you draw the line right although the neck you can make the case if you draw the line at a certain point here I guess suppose you could say makes the top part smaller and the bottom heavier if you see it that way I wouldn't dispute that you could say the bottom it's unbalanced therefore to the bottom toward the bottom definitely symmetrical left to right the rhythm very powerful with the plant motifs and vines on the neck the uh, waves of the ocean and the outline of the dragon it's all very strong repeated shapes and of course totally dynamic i don't see a straight line anywhere in it and of course the colors here are cool because white next to another color that's not black that would be neutral by definition then both the dragon and the background are cool colors there's no warm colors at all here the largest mass pretty easy <laughs> the dragon then the ocean if you count it as a single mass 
or you could say waves of the ocean. And then I guess the largest part of this uh, decorative detailing on the neck, the, the flower in the middle would be the third largest. For space, you just have overlapping. That's the only technique here. The lines are bold around the dragon, uh, obviously, and in the waves. Maybe not so much here, but even there, I would say there's bold outline. Yeah, I don't see much thin outline anywhere. The modeling is, of course, from the blue lines of the waves behind the dragon. There is some modeling on that. And you could make the case that simulated texture. It's supposed to imply the texture of, you know, very, uh, you know, strong wave patterns that are, you know, obviously roiling or, you know, crossing, uh, affecting, I am going to say, affecting the uh, surface of the uh, water, whether it's a bay or the ocean. It's in turmoil because of a storm, maybe. Uh, in any case, the water is not placid, and that creates a kind of texture with the uh, blue lines, as well as on this vase. I mean, I'm set, sorry, this flower on the neck that has similar texture. But the dragon doesn't have any, right? Um, balance rhythm. Oh, uh, for space, yeah, I think that's it. We covered it, didn't we? Modeling takes rhythm. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Now we get to one of the slides that is very, very important. And again, I won't be cutting this from the study list. Uh, you've all heard of this place, I'm sure, at some point in your, in your lives. Two words, forbidden city. Probably know forbidden, F-O-R-B-I-D-D, -D, two Ds. Forbidden, E-N, forbidden city. Location, now you need to say, because there is a phrase, that phrase, I mean, is not only applies to this site, but it is the most famous one, the one that people think of when they hear that phrase. So it's in Beijing, China. And that's in case you haven't written that word uh, before, B-E-I-J-I-N-G, Beijing, China. And again, you could ignore the little C. You could just say circa 1400 or 15th century. That will, that will work as well, because that's what we mean. Everyone knows this by now, right? That Prince got it wrong. It's party like it's 1999. He should say it's party like it's 2000 because the new century didn't begin in 2000, it began in 2001. Right, we are in the 21st century. So this is something built during the 1400s or 15th century, but you can just round it off and say, if you don't want to remember the little C, if you wrote 1400, you'd still get credit. But it wasn't built in a year, no, it took decades. So what is this? This is the Royal Palace Compound or you can say the city within the city of for the royal family or rulers of China, of the emperor and all of his staff, you know, his servants and his extended family. Usually they had dozens of children, multiple wives. I mean, that was the normal practice at this point in this culture, of course, in many other parts of the world. So there would have been hundreds of family members by, you know, extended family, that really was the case, as well as all of their servants, their bodyguards, and their advisors. It was a city within a city, uh, roughly two square miles. That's, that's around, I think it's a little less than that, but it's it maybe 1.8, just say nearly or about two point square miles within the city of Beijing, which today, and when this was built, had become the capital. It was the new capital. To, to us in the United States, that sounds, huh, what, new, 1400s? Yeah, Chinese cities go back thousands of years. Like I said, Canton slash Guang, Guangzhou is about, I, I didn't say how old, it's over 2000 years old, more like 3000 years old. So, so Beijing is a fairly new capital. Uh, in China, it was a new capital built by the Ming Dynasty. They created it. There was some kind of a town, but they expanded that area into their new capital. And then they also built this city within a city. It's a walled compound. You can see that if you get up close in some of these views, which is now, of course, a, a, a national and international historic site open to the public. It's an open air museum. That's one way to look at it. Uh, there's no more, right? I mean, not even Mao Zedong, when he took over, wanted to live here. Uh, so nobody has lived here since the early 1900s, uh, after the last emperor 
quick aside, that's one of the best movies I've ever seen. It'll break your heart. It's called The Last Emperor. Of all things, an Italian director made it, but he filmed it all on location. The story of the last uh, little boy who was their final emperor and the tragic life he led. Uh, it's a beautifully filmed movie called The Last Emperor. You could get extra credit if you watch it and write it, right? Remember, that's another option, a two-page summary of that movie. It's a little long, about three hours, but you can watch it in two settings. Excellent movie. And they use this entire site and the Chinese Communist government was the first time they ever let anybody film there. I think the movie's over 20 years old. Okay, so this was the site for hundreds of years of all of the residents and the temples. I mean, what else was here besides their homes? Well, their you know workshops. I mean, it was a, a city within a city, literally a self-contained community that didn't need, except for some items they imported mostly that was self-sustaining. So there were workshops, there were, you know, uh, food, you know, warehouses, uh, uh, kitchens, of course, uh, sleeping quarters for the thousands of people that lived here. I think the estimate is 10,000 or so, might be even a little low. And residential structures for, obviously the fanciest were for the emperor and his immediate family and, uh, or extended, I should say, family. And then other residential spaces, of course, for uh, members of the staff, and the, the, the bodyguards, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a city within a city in what is still today the capital city of China. So let's take a look at what these uh, structures are. This is part of the meaning still. These are courtyards, successive, you could say, courtyards or one obviously following another through which you had to pass in order to get to. There's a picture of Mao, by the way. <laughs> he was the emperor, Joe. He didn't call himself emperor, of course, the first dictator of uh, communist Chinese regime. Okay, so ignoring that fact, you would pass under his, his, his you could say that if you want, under his gigantic portrait. Look how small the people are. I mean, that's huge, right? I have friends who've been there and taken, I've never been to Beijing, but I've seen slides from friends who have been. So you pass under the main gate, into a, a, a courtyard that then you have to walk over these uh, water features. It's hard to tell, but these are water features. So there's a bridge, a marble bridge that you would take uh, to get through the first courtyard. And then you'd enter the celestial courtyard, the middle one, the one in the middle, which has the largest pagoda. Now we're going to define what a pagoda is on the, well, one of the two largest, oops, don't mean to do that. One of the two largest pagodas. So here we go, pagoda, it's not a long definition, but it could come up on the final. So you see it on your list of terms below Chinese three-tier perspective. Pagodas um, are a multi-tiered wooden, or are, uh, a pagoda is, is, sorry, is a multi-tiered wooden structure. It could be for any purpose most often religious, but here it's not religious necessarily. It might have been used for worship. So I'll say it again. Uh, a pagoda is a multi-tiered, or you could say multi-level if you prefer that, wooden structure, comma, with wide overhanging eaves. You see that? Wide overhanging eaves supported by projecting wooden brackets. Supported by projecting wooden brackets. It's hard to see in this view. We'll see much more of that when we get to uh, Japanese uh, slides on Wednesday, because it's common to almost all Asian cultures. Um, the parts of, the, of Asia I've been to, uh, Korea, South Korea, um, Southern China, Vietnam, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, all of those places, they were all separate independent governments then, uh, have, uh, have pagodas in their older wooden architecture. That's a common feature. Again, everybody got that definition. So this is a multi uh, multitude or series, you could say, of pagodas, which are behind the celestial courtyard, okay? Uh, which once you get past, you know, the, whoops, keep doing that. Let's just get the full view here. Uh, past the uh, forecourt or the outer courtyard, just say outer courtyard, keep it simple. You first had to walk across some water features on um, marble uh, footbridges. Of course, we're talking about footbridges. There wouldn't be vehicles, I don't believe, would use them. Um, and so vehicles would enter this area through some of the, you know, to deliver things to the royal compound. 
uh, in, in some other part of this, like here, right? There'd be gates to let them in, but this is for visitors to come in, dignitaries, diplomats, foreign, you know, visitors, and of course, uh, members of the royal uh, family um, of the emperor's extended family. Uh, when they came and went outside the compound. Of course, they didn't only live in the compound, but they could have stayed for years without needing to leave. And that last emperor did, by the way, that little boy, when he took over, he was like eight or nine, and he had only a few years left before the communist revolution overthrew what was left of imperial rule. <clears throat> so most of the time, you know, people with the royal family, their whole staff, all of the people that lived here, they were self-contained enough they could stay within the compound and not leave for years at a time but uh, usually the emperor would go out of his you know out of this forbidden city at least once a year if not more often to you know mingle among his own people of course not mean mingle but to you know be seen by his his people um <clears throat> but he wouldn't have to and then we have the inner courtyard right so you have the outer courtyard the celestial courtyard in the middle uh, with uh, one of the two large pagodas. And then here's the other extremely large pagoda here. I know this looks like one structure, but that's a separate one back there. So there's really a series of four, if you count the one on the uh, back uh, outer wall here, right? Uh, but this inner courtyard is where the upper would hold court inside that pagoda. So you had to be, you know, really important person or given special permission to go see the emperor or anyone in his family, his ministers. Maybe maybe you don't be allowed to meet with his son or his wife or someone else because only the very most important people in Chinese society. And this is the Ming era, I remember, but after the Ming fell, the Qing, C-H-I-N-G, so for two Chinese, is the last part of the meeting now, for two successive Chinese dynasties, the Ming and later Qing, the last Chinese dynasty, uh, all the emperors, for those two dynasties, that's over 400 years, um, 500, sorry, over 500 years occupied this royal compound. It was where they lived. And the only place that's bigger than this, the only royal compound larger is Versailles outside of Paris. That is the largest royal compound in the world. We talked about that before the midterm. Uh, but this would be, I think, second. It's hard to say for sure. I mean, someone may want to do some research for extra credit. I don't know of another royal compound bigger than this besides Versailles. So just say one of the largest, you could say largest few or two or three largest royal compounds in the world. It still is. But now, of course, it isn't that. It's a tourist site. It's an historic landmark. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. Formal analysis, yeah, it's completely symmetrical except that some people feel because this compound has a, a large pagoda and here the pagoda is much smaller and there's more trees here and less. Some people think it's weighted more towards the uh, uh, left, as far as left to right, towards the, the right. I don't see it that way because of the walls and the overall shape and, and the total area covered. Uh, and certainly the whole upper half is pretty much symmetrical. So I'd say it's roughly symmetrical left to right. And definitely if, you, if you're using this from top to bottom in the view we have here from the bottom to the far back or top of the picture. Uh, it's it's roughly balanced top to bottom, I think, and left to right. The rhythm is very obvious. All these pagodas and uh, gateways, you know, made out of uh, painted brick, I believe it is. You'll have to know that, but I'm pretty sure that's materials. Uh, in any case, what we're looking at now is is the rhythm of the repeated shapes everywhere you look. The courtyards themselves, even the gates and the pagodas, that's enough examples of repeated shapes. The textures are real. Uh, the real rough texture of wood on the pagodas and brick, it is painted brick on, on the gateways and then smooth marble uh, on this, uh, this bridge here. The edges of it, you can just see the top parts. And then there's more marble on the stairs leading up to the actual royal compound where the, the emperor would, you know, uh, greet visitors. Uh, and so there's some smooth marble and yet most of it, that's all real textures, right? Is rough wood and rough brick on the gates and the, and the wooden pagodas. Colors warm on the, uh, all the architecture, really it's warm. Well, except for the stairs here, yeah, right. 
and then this marble section, what little you can see there are the bridges. But of course the trees, if you want to count them as part of the compound and they've been there, I assume for centuries, uh, they create a, a uh, warm, uh, sorry, obviously it's green, therefore a cool color. So some cool uh, detail like mostly stairs and, and a little bit of decorative uh, detail like the bridges, but mostly it's warm, warm reds and, and uh, orange colors on the architecture, on the buildings and the uh, walls. Um, it is stable in that it's a rectangle and the walls are obviously completely stable, but the pagodas, the walls of the pagodas are stable, but the uh, overhanging eaves here, right? Projecting outward, especially the further back you go, you notice uh, those are dynamic. So you could just say it's both. Yeah, it's really noticeable here on this compound. All right, and then we have modeling is just the natural shadows in the sunlight. The line is visual line. You can't see painted line unless you get, but you're not going to have a close up here. See the Chinese characters. I'm not even sure what they'll say. And I think those were added, I think, by the current comics government. So originally there would have been no, at least in a view like this, any obvious painted line or carved line, even though on the pagodas the, the beams are carved, but you have to get up close. So you could just say, in this view, there are only visual lines formed by the edges of the buildings and the walls. Okay, uh, the largest mass that would be probably the actual, yeah, it would be the, the royal, the, the emperor's actual compound where he resided somewhere back here, I think it was, or in this structure and received guests. If you count that as one mass, which it basically is, that would be the largest. And then perhaps the uh, second largest mass would be the pagoda in front of, or at the end of the celestial court here. Um, and then I guess you decide if these may be over here on the left, uh, sorry, I meant right in that side court yard would be the third largest. Um, texture, you already mentioned, um, right? Let's see, are we forgetting anything? Uh, stable or dynamic? Yeah, I think we've covered it all. Um, okay, let's move on to our last must know. I love this painting. It's so similar to one that I have on the wall of my uh, dining room that I, for those who care to literally glance, take 30 seconds, I'll show it to you. I'll hold it up to the screen when we finish with the notes. This is our last muscle. So you do want to take uh, notes of this. Poet on a mountain top, just like it sounds. Poet on a mountain top, one word. China, again, circa 1500s, or you can just say you could say 16th century or just 1500 will be close enough. This is a really clear example of the three things I started today's lecture with about Chinese scholars slash artists, that class of people. And the golden age under this is definitely Ming. And that's remember the, in essence, the high point of, of, of Chinese imperial, some would say history or culture, but certainly of the arts. We already said this is a period when arts flourish because of the sponsorship by the Mings, the, uh, the ruling class. So here we have a poet, and those are his thoughts projected out into space or into the air, if you want to say it that way. He's contemplating whatever the beauty of this scene evokes in his his mind and his you know his thoughts and his feelings. Uh, and so there it is, the words hanging in the air coming from him. I really like this piece. And then you have pagodas here and you've got trees and boulders and mountains. And here's your atmosphere. I'm sorry, whoops, I misspoke Chinese three tier perspective. It's visible down in the valley here because that's far enough away from them that it could be considered almost middle ground here. Uh, but the only thing different about this is that uh, this mountain is not shown as sharp as most Chinese three tier perspective would be. So you could say it's a limited, use of or a partial is probably a better way to say it, partial use of Chinese three-tier perspective it has two of the three aspects that I gave you as a definition are present here. But the main thing that this, the meaning of this illustrates is the importance of the scholar class as both a painter. So this is definitely the artist who painted this and composed the poem and printed the, the words of his poem right onto this uh, work of art. Now, this is not a scroll painting. This would be a wall painting to be hung on a wall and probably not moved uh, at least <laughs> for a long time. Uh, 
so it has, again, this is a Ming Dynasty period piece. So we've covered who the Mings were. That's the other part of the meaning. All right, let's do a formal analysis and we'll end just about on time. Then I'll stick around for any questions. Um, here we have the rhythm is powerful. The edges of the creek, uh, I mean, of the of the uh, boulder here, or, or the uh, crest is what I was trying to say, of this um, rock outcropping. Uh, you can't really say that's a mountain, right? But it's too big of a, a boulder. So you can say this outcropping or ridge, if you prefer, where the poet is standing has really strong rhythm in the crevices of the face of it, the rock face. The trees, of course, create rhythm. The pagodas here, you can at least see two, actually, you could even say three. And of course, the mountains in the distance have similar shapes. Uh, for space here, you do have overlapping, obviously, and diminishing size as objects fade. And I'd say foreshortening on the, uh, the top of that uh, outcropping there, or that hill, that crest. Uh, I see foreshortening there. And uh, to some degree, maybe on the side of this mountain. Uh, but here, you want to be careful to say that, yeah, there's two or partial use or, you know, some uh, limited uh, use of Chinese three-tier perspective in the foreground and the middle ground, but not in the distance. Okay, it's all neutral colors, except for this one character here. Uh, the only thing warm, well, the, at the bottom, too. It's probably the signature of the artist. Uh, but those would be, of course, not most of the composition is black and white and shades of gray by definition not warm or cool but uh, neutral there's bold outline around most of the objects you can see that here on the mountainside here and the pagodas um e even around the poet if you get up close around right his body so there's a lot of bold outline i don't see much thin outline unless you could make the case that this is yeah there's a little bit of line there so perhaps on the far left there's some thin outline but I wouldn't even say the pagodas have that. Yeah, possibly the mountain in the distance. Um, the largest mass is the main uh, rock or outcropping uh, crest, whatever word you want to use, uh, which is a single object the poet's standing on. Uh, and then I guess it's a close call, but I'd say the second largest because it fades here. We don't see much of it in the lower right corner. But what we can see of the hill to the far left is probably the second largest mass and then you you be the judge if these boulders all create one mass in your mind that could be the um, third largest or you could say perhaps the mountain in the distance or this mountain here um, let's see balance yes roughly to me it is because these words and this one section in the lower these in two opposite corners and then here and here i'd say it's roughly balanced left to right and maybe not so much top to bottom because of course of the empty space uh, in most of the upper third or so. So you'd say it's unbalanced towards the bottom. Um, and then obviously it has rhythm. Oh, it's dynamic. Uh, the only thing stable could be one or two of the tree trunks. But when you get up close, there's very few, maybe three or four of those that are straight. Uh, so even most of the trees are dynamic, all of the land, rest of the landscape, the pagodas, <clears throat> and of course these letters are dynamic by definition. Okay, so I'm going to now, uh, let's do this. I'm going to do stop the share and allow you to answer questions, but I, I think it might be interesting. It literally is the next room over, actually, this way, uh, for me to grab, it's on the wall, I'll bring it to you that I have from this same period. You right back. I meant to, I should have had it next to the computer, but I think for those of you who have any interest in this, especially if you ever travel to China, you can you can buy things like this legally there. I paid a decent amount for it. I don't remember what it was, but it was more than I might have uh, normally done, but I knew I wasn't going to get back to China. And do you see there's a vague similarity here? This is from 1880, according to the, um, it was in a museum shop, and it's not a replica. It's signed on the back. And that number, oops, there it is, tells you that it's legally exportable. 
you definitely don't want to buy something from an unauthorized dealer in China. You can get arrested at the border trying to leave or something like that because it's their heritage. So this I bought legally. And uh, you see a maybe another poet. I'm not sure, but it, it, it even has up here whoops, some of the same kinds of characters hanging in the air. And then someone on a boat, of course, some people say, well, that looks like it's floating in the air. But it's obviously a kind of Chinese perspective, not three tier, because it doesn't use the misty, hazy look that we've been seeing. But there's a lot of similarity in the techniques here. So this is what uh, late Qing dynasty. And it's the part of the same tradition of Chinese scholarship class or scholar class where they had to also double as artists, writers and arts. And here you've got more color than the one uh, we saw, the two we saw. So I was told that, you know, whatever I paid for it, this was in the 90s, is definitely, yeah, I didn't buy it because of that. I just liked it and I wanted it on the wall of my uh, dining room. <clears throat> so probably was used for dining purposes, but I don't use it for that. I just keep it in a, uh, an antiques case that I bought in Santa Rosa <laughs> many years ago when I bought my house. Okay, so questions, anybody about anything we covered today, extra credit, uh, late papers, Now's the time, remember, this is my unofficial office hours. Oh, now I was wondering what that was, but I guess. I... <laughs> yeah. Do you know what museum that last one is in, the poet on a mountaintop? Oh, the last must know? Yeah. No, the poet on no I don't, but Stockstad uh, should, should have that. But usually it's in the index, uh, uh, not the index, I don't mean the index, the uh, credits, uh, images or photo credits. They're supposed to mention that, and I'm, I'm sure they had to pay a fee. Yeah, it's I don't kind know. Of hard. Be interesting to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but a lot of them do look like that, and I feel like I've seen so many like that at the Asian Arts Museum. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the one in San Francisco. Well, that's a good option for extra credit for any of you. Uh, I like that museum a lot. I, yeah. I went there the first month it was open with a student from Poland, of all things, and she had studied Chinese history and art, and uh, she wanted to be an art historian. So it was just fun because what, what I learned from talking to someone who'd studied even more than I ever have some of that culture, but she had never been to China, and I had, so it was kind of interesting to, to do that. So, but you can go, you know, anytime, remember, up until, but not after the final exam week, extra credit is still accepted during but not after up until the day of the final so you could do that i think they have a an immersive asian art theme exhibit that's similar to the van gogh immersive exhibit that i talked to you about that i went to with a friend as well back in gosh uh, august which is i hear really fantastic that you see themes and 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 uh, light you know of course it's a light show basically uh, that come from traditional images in Asian art from not just one culture, but I believe China, Japan, India, perhaps. I don't know. Anyway, um, I'd like to know more about, yeah, if anyone finds out where that came from. Uh, you could maybe even do a little five point extra credit thing if you want to. Uh, any of the images we've seen. Yeah, I don't usually, that's more detail than I have time to delve into, but it could be valuable for anybody who's plan to write another paper on the subject or do extra credit or even travel to China. Uh, the people I met were really great when I was in China. They were really fascinated with Americans. I, when I was there in the 90s, there weren't that many Americans. I was I think one of three or four in an entire hotel of 2000 rooms built by the Chinese government over the Pearl River with views all the way, almost not quite to the coast because that's a very wide river, wider than the Mississippi. And that is the oldest big city in China. It's, I, I went up the, just real quick. So I didn't know they had pagodas a thousand years old there. I got to climb up them, but believe me, when it's 90 some degrees and humid, about 90% humidity, be prepared, you might feel. And I was in pretty good shape then, so it wasn't about my health, but I almost fainted a couple of times. Wooden staircases and narrow, windy, you know, nine story tall pagodas, that's hundreds of feet. But it was worth it for the views of the old town and the uh, uh, wooden structure itself was fascinating to look at a 900 year old nine story handmade wooden pagoda. And uh, it's the real thing. And then, of course, at the, on the ground floor, there were statues of Buddha 
beautifully done, painted with gold leaf and stuff. Yeah. So that's one thing you might want to think about if you're going to China. Beijing, I would like to go to, but I don't think I'll probably ever get there. Uh, it's the most polluted big city in China. Well, Shanghai is the other one. Uh, I imagine by now, Guangzhou, Guang, sorry, Zhu, uh, or it's old Canton would also be, but it wasn't that polluted when I was there 25 years ago. Anyway, something to think about if you have the option to travel that part of the world. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I had a quick question, yes, Mark, please. about the uh, the hundred birds and the peacocks. When we were yeah. talking about the the balance for that, it kind of looked like there was water on that texture and that spot that we were saying it might have been unbalanced. Is that water right there or no? I don't think so. I've seen larger images of it on the internet and it didn't appear to be, and it wasn't described that way in any of the texts or uh, websites I've looked at. I've only looked at like two. So I don't think so. I think it was just, uh, you know, kind of nondescript ground. <laughs> okay. Fading off into the distance. Okay. Um, I'm still available for questions anybody has. Uh, don't forget, if you didn't do your paper, don't wait till two or three weeks from now. It wouldn't be wise to wait that long to turn it in. Okay, uh, let's see. Is there any... I'm just going to check one thing here and see if there's anything I didn't get from the chat section that didn't get answered. Well, these, this is the time for verbal. Uh, and of course, you could obviously always, always email me. But the only time I don't respond within 24 hours is uh, Friday to Sunday night. I take off that part of the weekend for family time. Otherwise, I get back to you within 24 hours, usually, from any inquiry, extra credit. Uh, not that many people have done extra credit yet. Several people have, but nobody's come close to the 60 points. Remember now, your, your maximum allowed extra credit or uh, option for, uh, for total points is 60 points now instead of 50. Okay, so you guys still have plenty of opportunity if you want to take advantage of that. All right, one more time. Anybody else with any questions relating to anything we just covered? Extra credit, late papers, anything else? Chinese art. Okay, thank you guys all. We'll see you, and we're going to do Chinese art. It should be very interesting because some of the work is relevant to those who are uh, interested in uh, modern Chinese style artwork i think you know what i'm talking i mean sorry i meant i misspoke japanese mass-produced art that we see now has its roots in 18th century japanese line drawing i'll explain that when we like hokusai some of you know the great wave that's only one classic example but there's a lot more um <clears throat> yukio we'll talk about what that is it's it's a uh, <clears throat> controversial <laughs> i'll say it that way so that's wednesday so i hope you'll all be here you know, by VO3 signed on, then we'll start the lecture for Japanese art. All right. That's it. One more time, anybody? All right. See you guys on Wednesday. Take care. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. You're welcome.